Good day grade 11s, welcome to your next lesson on intermolecular forces. In this lesson we're going to be speaking specifically about one type of van der Waals force, which is a dipole-dipole force. Now I found this excellent video, it's really good. Please note that they call it bonding instead of forces. Don't worry about it, they're just Australian, no, I'm kidding. Every curriculum has their own rules, okay? But it's still the same principle. So please watch this carefully, it's a very good video and explains it very well. Intermolecular bonding. Inter meaning between molecules, so the bonding between molecules. To understand the bonding between molecules, we first need to understand how molecules are bonded together. And this is via covalent bonding. And I've just used an example here, which is hydrochloric acid or hydrogen chloride. So you'll see here, hydrogen's got one electron in its outside shell and chlorine's got seven. To get a full outer shell, chlorine needs to share one electron and hydrogen needs to share one electron. So they'll do this and we replace the non-bonding electrons with a lone pair and we can see that they will form a bond here. This will be a covalent bond and that will form one single covalent bond. The covalent bonds are intramolecular bonds. Intra meaning within the molecule. And this is a term that gets confused with inter. And I like to think of it as being the intranet versus the internet. Now the intranet at school is the intranet within the school. So this is the bond within the molecule. And it looks like something like this. If another hydrogen chloride molecule comes along, what will happen is these two will bond with each other. And the bond between the two molecules is the intermolecular bond. So think of internet. This is the internet between different schools and the intermolecular bonding is between different molecules. The intramolecular is within the school or within the molecule, just as intra is within the school. So intermolecular bonds are forces between molecules. There's three different types and I'm going to run through each of these. First we need to have a little recollection of electronegativity and what that means. Electronegativity is the ability of an atom to attract electrons. So it's how well an atom is able to attract electrons to itself. Metals have low electronegativity, whereas non-metals have high electronegativity. They easily attract electrons. If you look at the atoms on a periodic table, you'll find that electronegativity will decrease as you go down any group and it increases as you go across a period. So it increases in this direction with fluorine being or having the highest electronegativity. What we use in chemistry is an electronegativity table and someone's gone and worked out the precise electronegativity of all of these different elements. And as we can see here, fluorine has the highest number for electronegativity. The higher the electronegativity means the greater the attraction of electrons to an atom. Nonpolar covalent bonds. This is when electrons are shared equally between atoms. So it's when a covalent bond occurs between identical elements such as O2, H2 or Cl2. So with a non-polar covalent bond, the electrons get shared evenly. And this is because they have equal electronegativity, which means that they're sharing those electrons equally. Fluorine, for instance, will pair up with itself. Both fluorines have an electronegativity of 4.0, so they will share these electrons equally. Neither of these atoms has a higher electronegativity, so they get shared evenly. Polar covalent bonds, however, are when electrons are not shared equally. 
and this will happen with elements of different electronegativities. So basically whenever you have two different elements that are covalently bonded to one another, the electrons are not going to be shared equally because they have different electronegativities. So the more electronegativity an element is, the greater a share of the electrons it'll have. So if you compare hydrogen, which has a lower electronegativity than chlorine, which has a higher electronegativity, chlorine will have a greater share of the electrons. And it's represented in this way, with chlorine having a greater share of electrons than hydrogen, which has a smaller share. So in other words, the electron from hydrogen will spend more time over towards the chlorine. And this is an interactive here showing what happens with hydrogen fluoride. So you'll see when they meet up, what happens is fluoride has a greater electronegativity so it attracts the hydrogen's electron more closely towards it. And so what happens is a slight positive charge is on this side because it has less electrons and a slight negative charge forms on this side. So, when you have two elements that have the same electronegativity, they share the electrons equally and it is a non-polar bond. Polar meaning charge. However, when they have different electronegativities, the one with the higher electronegativity will have the greater share of electrons. This forms a polar bond, with the chlorine having a more negative charge than the hydrogen. This sets us up for dipole-dipole forces. So, we've just discovered that Chlorine will have a greater share of electrons than hydrogen and form a polar covalent bond. So what actually happens is these form then a slight negative charge and a slight positive charge. And this funny symbol at the front is a delta. So it's called a delta negative and a delta positive. And it's basically just meaning it's a partial charge. So it gets a very slight negative charge on the chlorine and a slight positive charge on the hydrogen. And it's represented like this. Slight positive and a slight negative. What this is called is a dipole, meaning di two and poles positive and negative. Weak attractions are now able to occur between the HCl molecules. So you'll see here there's a positive and a negative and this negative can attract to this positive. This negative will attract to this positive. And these are weak attractions. So they will attract to one another. And these are called intermolecular bonds. They're the bonds between molecules. And in this case they're called dipole-dipole forces because it's one dipole being attracted to another dipole. Dipole-dipole forces. This causes molecules to have higher melting and boiling points. It's the dipole-dipole attraction. And if we have a look here, the gas model, you have molecules which are far apart. When they slow down, this dipole-dipole attraction takes place and there'll be some slight attraction between these molecules. And of course, in a solid, these attractions are even stronger. For a molecule to be polar, it must have two things. The first thing it must do is it must have polar bonds. So polar bonds will occur whenever any two different elements are covalently bonded together. So here we can see hydrogen and carbon. Hydrogen has less share than carbon does. Carbon has a greater electronegativity. And oxygen again has even a greater electronegativity. Here, carbon has a lower electronegativity than oxygen, so oxygen will get a slight delta negative and carbons will get that slight delta positive charge. 
However, we must also look at whether the partial charges or the molecule is asymmetrical or symmetrical. It needs to be asymmetrical for a molecule to be polar. So if we have a look here at the molecule, there's a definite positive end and a definite negative end. And this means that it's asymmetrical. And this means that the negative on the following molecule will be able to be attracted to the positive on this side. However, with carbon dioxide, we've got two negative ends with a positive middle. So there's not one positive side and not one negative side. So it's a symmetrical molecule. So this is a non-polar molecule. Let's have a look at a couple of examples. So here I've got hydrogen chloride. And the little arrow here is indicating which has got the greater share of electrons or which is the most electronegative. So in this case, chlorine has... So it gets a delta negative and hydrogen gets a delta positive. So we've got two different elements here and it's an asymmetrical molecule. So it has to be a polar molecule. Let's have a look at the nitrogens with the hydrogens here on ammonia. We have a delta negative on nitrogen and delta positives on hydrogen. Nitrogen has a higher electronegativity. It is an asymmetrical molecule. We have a definite negative end and a definite positive end, so it must be a polar molecule. If we have a look, however, at carbon tetrachloride, we have negatives on the chlorine atoms because they have a higher electronegativity and a delta positive on the carbon. There are polar bonds present, however, it is a symmetrical molecule. There is not one definite positive and negative side. So this is a non-polar molecule. If we have a look, however, at this molecule here, we have a negative side and a positive side so it has to be a polar molecule. And last but not least is this pyramidal shape. And we need to be careful with this because this is a planar pyramid shape. And we have negatives, but we have a positive in the middle. And because this is flat, there's not a positive and negative sign. So it is a non-polar molecule. So shape is really important in determining whether a molecule is polar or non-polar. Right, grade 11s, I hope you found that very, very useful. I did. Please note the reason she spoke to you about covalent bonding is that you can answer, you can understand that dipole-dipole forces only occur between molecules that are polar. They cannot occur between non-polar because then they don't have their dipole ends, the two ends are positive and negative. Please make sure you understand this and can explain it to your friends and then go do the assessment at the end of the section. Have a great day.